Every baptized person is called to be a missionary. So we have a call from the Lord himself to proclaim the gospel wherever we are. Our world today needs witnesses, giving a witness to Jesus Christ, his compassion and hope. That was the original intention of uh, Pauline Jarico. Pauline Jarico is still inspiring our, our work because uh, she gave, in a very simple way, the charism of the Pontifical Mission Societies. Marie Pauline Jericho, she is an icon of faith to every woman, to every lady person. Wherever we are, our state of life is the beginning of what we can do and what we can be. The work of Pauline Jericho is evident all over the world today. There's no place you can go that it's not been touched by Pauline Jericho. Pauline Jericho's vision that started in a small town in France has now become one of the largest missionary outreach organizations to touch all the corners of the earth. What an amazing witness the power of one person to transform the whole world. Cari fratelli e sorelle, ciascuno di noi ha, ciascuno di noi è una missione in questa terra. Siamo qui per testimoniare, benedire, consolare, rialzare, trasmettere la bellezza di Gesù. Coraggio. World Mission Sunday was originally instituted in 1926 by Pope Pius XI as a day for the whole church to pray for the missions, to pray for the people who have not heard the gospel, and to pray for the missionaries who leave their homeland in order to bring the gospel to many, many parts of the world the World Mission Sunday collection. It was inspired by uh, Pauline Jarico and the other Pontifical Mission Societies. What is the Pontifical Mission Societies? What is it that we do? It's th to recognize that I am part of a broad worldwide family, a worldwide network of prayer and almsgiving to assist those uh, who are just coming now to know Christ so that their faith might be strong. This is at the heart of World Mission Sunday. It's the command of Christ to St. Peter, strengthen your brothers. We celebrate the fact that our faith is missionary by nature. And this gives us the possibility to um, animate the faithful that they discover this missionary vocation everyone has, and also to share what they can in order to help their brothers and sisters in other parts of the world. The Mission Sunday, it's that one day where everyone is praying towards um, the missionary activities to support the work that the Pope is doing.
We have gathered children from different parishes. Uh, we had uh, about 3,000 children who have gathered for the prayer of the rosary. So uh, this is the big event which uh, is done every year. Marie Pauline Jericot, the work that she did remind us every day of what we should do in our mission of evangelization. This Society for Propagation of the Faith raises awareness among all the baptized and encourages the spirit that fosters prayer. Christians know the charism of Pontifical Mission Societies, and these charisms are faith, universal church, and mission. They have been helping and supporting us a lot. And this cannot forget the background we have with uh, Mary Jaricot. And she has begun something which is very, very essential. She was a linchpin a spring bud to what, what, what that is happening today. The charisma of Pauline Jarico was aimed at helping people to live out their own missionary vocation. And so we can ask ourselves after 200 years, what does it mean for our Christian people, for our baptized people? What does it mean to be missionary? Pauline Jericho was born on July 22nd, 1799, in Lyon in France. Her family was typical of the day, very pious, very hardworking, uh, and large. Pauline was born at the end of the French Revolution, at a time when the Catholic Church had been under assault, really, for the last decade. By the time she became uh, an infant in 1799, her family was considered almost like an outlaw group. The revolution had spread its, uh, its very menacing, almost poisonous aspects into all aspects of French society, but especially into the church. The Catholicism of the Middle Ages was completely gone. The faith carried on simply in families, passing it on from one generation to another. This was the experience of the Jericho family as well. 
sa famille, comme euh, tous les Lyonnais, connaît une période très, très, très difficile, marquée par les violences de la terreur. À Lyon, la terreur a fait près de 2000 morts, fusillés ou guillotinés. Et parmi ces morts, il y a beaucoup de catholiques et beaucoup de familles catholiques qui ont été euh, très marquées par ça. Le désir, euh, en 1799, c'est de restaurer la, la confiance, restaurer l'Église. The Jerichos were uh, close-knit, had lots and lots of family encounters, lots of cousins, all very connected to the city of Lyon. They were well-known in the city, in part because of Antoine's business, and Pauline herself um, was totally devoted to her parents. Phileas and Pauline are the two sons of the family. Euh, ils s'entendent très bien, ils se chamaillent beaucoup, mais ils sont absolument inséparables. Pauline affiche avec son frère très tôt une très grande ferveur, et lui, comme on parlait des missionnaires aussi, déjà très tôt, il y a cette envie de vouloir être missionnaire et de reconquérir, de conquérir les âmes, même les âmes hors de France. With the end of the revolution and coming of the Napoleonic period, which meant more toleration, the father's silk factory could um, continue to prosper. It's here that Pauline is going to become a much more prominent person. Le père a de l'aisance, euh, il a réussi, il a même fait fortune, et euh, Pauline eh bien, est prise dans, un, dans cette société. Et cette société bourgeoise, il euh, y a de la mondanité, euh, elle s'habille bien, elle se met de beaux vêtements, euh, des bijoux, she was really deeply um, conflicted in many ways uh, and really sort of represents her own spiritual growth but also represents French society at the time. Uh, she loved going to parties and she loved being the center of attention at parties. But at the same time, she also had a deep religious sensibility and she really experienced a religious conversion, particularly around the time when uh, she herself became ill. Lorsqu'elle avait 15 ans, Pauline a connu un accident qui l'a marqué physiquement et qui, sans nul doute, l'a fait grandir en maturité. Cet accident qui a pu avoir un retentissement visible l'a marqué, a marqué son entourage. En fait, elle tombe d'un tabouret. Alors, on pense qu'elle s'est blessée, que la blessure a été mal soignée, s'est inflammée, et du coup, elle tombe malade et gravement malade. Elle, elle, elle se décrit elle-même pendant cette période-là. C'est absolument euh, épouvantable. She was bedridden for a number of uh, months, at which time her own mother nursed her back to health, or so she thought, because in the process of tending her. Her mom, Jeanne, died. It was just too exhausting for her mother to care for her daughter. So this was a completely traumatic incident in this young girl's life. Her recovery was painful and slow. And then uh, listening to a sermon on, uh, in her parish, she had this profound, I would say, religious awakening, deep experience of of, I would say, the Paschal mystery of the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And she had this great desire uh, to deepen that experience and to share it with others. Elle décide de plus se tourner vers Christ, et c'est à ce moment-là que, justement, elle fait vœu de chasteté et de se consacrer à l'Église. Et son cœur, qui brûlait déjà d'amour pour le Seigneur, va se manifester encore plus clairement dans l'amour des autres, et en particulier des pauvres. Son cœur était nourri par une vie de prière, en particulier par l'adoration eucharistique, par la prière très fidèle à la Vierge Marie, la tournée vers les autres.
So now we have a young woman who is part of a bourgeois Catholic family in Lyon, whose father owns a silk factory. The silk factory is now in the midst of a newly industrial society. She's very concerned about the women workers in silk factories, and so she wants to organize them. And so she goes about this by setting up a society of prayer. The reparation of the Sacred Heart of Jesus is what it's called. And, and it's a group of women, working women, who come together and they will start to pray. Pauline se trouve là, dans les rues de Lyon, avec euh, ses filles qu'elle embauche à la fois dans la charité et dans l'évangélisation. Et en même temps, elle est stimulée par son frère, qui entre Phileas. Il est en lien avec les missions étrangères de Paris. Et euh, il euh, est sollicité pour aller au secours de la Chine. Even though he was enrolled in the uh, seminary in Paris to send missionaries to China, his health would not permit it. After ordination, he came home. Uh, he settled in Lyon and helped her as much as possible. And so for the two of them, they worked out very practical ways in which young people could help. For the Jerichos, that involved the use of the family fortune for good. Pauline voyait bien qu'autour d'elle, la foi n'était pas partagée par tous. Et donc, elle voulait que le Christ soit connu et aimé par un plus grand nombre de personnes. Pauline est une femme qui a une imagination et une créativité absolument extraordinaire. C'est sa force, quelque part, sa créativité et sa foi. On est, après la Révolution française, dans une période d'un très grand renouveau missionnaire. Les, les missions intéressent tout le monde à ce moment-là. Pauline est mobilisée par son frère. Et donc, elle a à la fois, j'allais dire, la, la main-d'œuvre à portée de main avec ses réparatrices, et puis les sollicitations de son frère. Pauline Jaricot, elle se dit, ben moi, je vais faire une chose, c'est que mes réparatrices du Sacré-Cœur, je vais les mobiliser pour qu'elles donnent de l'argent. She had a very simple idea that had universal scope. It was a very, very simple idea. She, said, she thought, let us, let us have 10 people that pray, reflect about the missions and offer one penny, not much, one penny um, each, and, and have them each try to find 10 other people to find another circle to do the same. And in effect, what she did was she created a worldwide network Ten people praying together, and then ten people, each one dropping a penny in the collection basket. Gradually, the number of ten became the number of hundreds, the number of hundreds became numbers of thousands. And she did not only collect money, but trained other women to do smaller things, smaller projects that would raise money for the missions. Génie de Pauline Ladon c'est qu'elle a euh, mobilisé tous les laïcs dans l'effort de la mission. Ça ne concerne pas que des prêtres, des frères, des religieuses, ça va concerner tout le peuple chrétien qu'elle va mettre dans une même association liée l'ensemble de la chrétienté. Et euh, c'est donc cette œuvre qui, qui, va, qui va donc s'appeler l'œuvre de la propagation de la foi. The catalyst for the founding of the Society of the Propagation of the Faith was a meeting that occurred in May 1822 in the apartment of the Vicar General of the Bishop of Louisiana in the city of Lyon in France. Pauline Jericho is the figure who is recognized as the main foundress of the association, but there were other people who were involved in the establishment of the society. Les personnalités qui ont aidé Pauline Jericho dès le départ dans cette association, euh, c'est évidemment Phileas, son frère, prêtre, c'est euh, son euh, Victor Giraudon, puis Benoît Coste, 
et ils la soutiennent dans cette œuvre et euh, ils décident même de lui donner un contenu plus juridique. À cette réunion, ces messieurs discutent donc d'une œuvre pour euh, aller au secours des missions, faire connaître les missions, générer des vocations. À cette réunion du 3 mai est adopté le plan de Pauline. C'est l'acte fondateur, en quelque sorte, de la propagation de la foi. L'œuvre de la propagation de la foi va connaître un très, très grand développement, un très grand rayonnement qui dure encore aujourd'hui. As the society's membership grew, uh, it came to the attention of the local bishop that this was something that's going to catch on. The higher-ups, they realized this had national and perhaps even international significance. And so it required uh, a certain amount of authority that only the Pope could give. Pope Gregory was really enthusiastic about the whole project, um, decided uh, this is well worth pursuing, it was not a difficult choice to approve this society. The Society for the Propagation of the Faith was deeply involved in the whole of the United States, which was a mission territory well until the 20th century. But particularly in the American South, where Catholics comprise less than 3% of the population. As an American, I think to myself, you know, we have been such beneficiaries of this work. In the late 1800s and, and or very early 1900s, we were recipients of about $7 million. You know, would you think that people in France, lay people, not professional religious, were concerned, interested, and wanting to support the growing of the church here. Why? Because they encountered Christ, they knew Christ, they loved Christ, and they wanted others to come to know and love him as well. Two thirds, in fact, came to the Diocese of New Orleans. Uh, bishop de Burg, who was a French uh, bishop in the United States, uh, had been working in the diocese for a number of years and so Bishop de Berg was one of the uh, first recipients of society funds. Two thirds went to his diocese, another third went to the Chinese missions. What's fascinating is Pauline Jericho in her own writings, she refers to the light that lit the match of the world. And so in so many ways, her own particular sense of the role and the importance of the missions in the United States really do represent not only her own missionary heart, but really a prophetic spirit that indicates in so many ways that the church in the United States would actually become a beacon of light and evangelization for the rest of the world. Au lendemain de la fondation de la propagation de la foi en 1822, Pauline retire. Elle se retire à peu près de toutes ses actions. Son directeur spirituel, à ce moment-là, est persuadé qu'elle a une vocation contemplative et il l'empêche littéralement de se livrer à toutes ses activités de charité. Elle, elle lui obéissait. Elle vit cette période très difficile, mais par rapport à la propagation de la foi, ça va se répandre dans toute la France, dans l'Europe, dans le monde entier, et Pauline devient étrangère à ce qui s'y passe. Elle va sortir de cette période difficile au moment de la mort de son directeur spirituel en 1826, et Pauline est très marquée par cette mort. Elle passe son temps 
au, au pied de la croix à Saint-Nizier. L'Eucharistie a une importance très grande aussi pour elle. Elle prie euh, beaucoup aussi la Vierge Marie et avec ses réparatrices, elle voudrait bien les entraîner dans sa spiritualité, dans, dans sa prière. Et donc, elle se demande comment elle pourrait permettre que le rosaire soit prié par un plus grand nombre de personnes. Et c'est là qu'elle, avec toujours son génie de l'invention et son génie des solidarités, en inventant ce qu'elle appelle le rosaire vivant. C'est toujours des intuitions assez géniales qui arrivent comme ça dans la pensée de Pauline. Pauline a l'intuition qu'il faut redonner le goût de Dieu toujours dans l'esprit de la reconquête spirituelle. Elle va mettre en place ce qu'on appelle le rosaire vivant. What Pauline has is the idea of a rosary society that will involve 15 members in each we'll call themselves and that's 15 members of the society because there are 15 mysteries of the rosary. Five glorious, five sorrowful, five joyful. So the idea was you have 15 mysteries, you have 15 people, each of them praying a different mystery of the rosary every day, each of them contributing a little bit of a, a sou to it. They call it the living rosary because this means constantly, everywhere throughout the world, the rosary is being prayed, the Virgin Mary is being venerated. Avec le rosaire vivant, a toujours eu à l'esprit une dimension missionnaire, car elle est profondément convaincue, comme toute l'Église, que la Vierge Marie est proche de toute personne sur cette terre. Il est simple hein, et génial, en fait, et qui va, qui va fonctionner euh, absolument euh, euh, à merveille hein, et prendre une extension euh, absolument euh, extraordinaire et très rapidement mondiale. Par exemple, rien qu'en France, à la mort de Pauline en 1862, il y a 2 millions et demi d'associés du rosaire vivant. Elle achète justement en 1831 la maison à Lyon, qu'elle va appeler Maison de Lorette, qui fait écho à la Lorette, la maison de la Vierge en Italie. Et euh, là, elle y met d'ailleurs une invocation au mari conçu sans péché. Et dans cette maison, elle a l'adoration eucharistique, mais elle réunit, comme toujours, des jeunes filles de toutes conditions qui viennent, qu'elle va appeler les filles de Marie, et qui vont justement se lancer dans cette euh, prière euh, et puis euh, dans les œuvres des œuvres de charité aussi. Elle vivait déjà personnellement une consécration dans le secret de son cœur. Mais elle voyait bien autour d'elle des personnes qui avaient envie de vivre une vie consacrée. Et donc, elle a réuni ces femmes qui était issu aussi de milieux très différents. Cette maison de Lorette, elle appartient aujourd'hui encore aux œuvres pontificales missionnaires. C'est vraiment un lieu de pèlerinage que l'on peut recommander. En 1834, Pauline decided to make a pilgrimage to Rome. Partly this was to ask that all of the work that she had done be transferred to Rome. But it was also personal. Um, she had a, an intense desire not only to uh, make a pilgrimage to Rome in part as a reparation for the church in France and to try and build peace in French society. She also had this desire to go visit holy places as a means to cure her own health. Some of this was her mental health, some of it was her physical health. Health 
concerns had always been an issue for Pauline, and by 1835, her health had deteriorated so badly that many feared she did not have long to live. Pauline left for Italy in 1835 on a pilgrimage to pray for healing. By the time she arrives, she's completely exhausted and takes up residence uh, in a convent, which is led by Madeleine Sophie Barat. So Madeleine Sophie is uh, the head of the Religious Sisters of the Sacred Heart. The Pope hears of this and decides to go and visit her there. She tells the Pope that she intends to further her pilgrimage to go to the tomb of St. Philomena. St. Philomena's tomb is just outside of uh, Naples in a town called Mugnano. And so the Pope protested that Pauline was too ill to go, but she said, I'll make a deal with you. If I return from my pilgrimage, you have to move this cause forward. She makes the pilgrimage in 1835. On est en août 1835. Pendant la prière dans l'église où sont les reliques de Philomène, elle ressent quelque chose dans son corps. Elle rentre dans sa chambre et le lendemain, elle sort debout et elle repart à Rome sur ses pieds. Elle va voir le pape, le pape qui l'a fait marcher devant elle, qui l'a fait bouger, etc. Et qui va lui demander d'ailleurs de rester plusieurs mois à Rome le temps de vérifier la, 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 la guérison. Le pape là reconnaît la sainteté de cette Philomène et Pauline repart après en France avec des reliques de Sainte Philomène, dont une relique qu'elle remet au curé d'Ars qui lui aussi aurait été guéri euh, par l'intercession de, de Sainte Philomène euh, bon, et qui a fait aussi une grande dévotion à Ars euh, autour de Sainte Philomène. I think that her trips to Rome and then her contact with the relics of Saint Philomena reinforced her sense of Catholicity, that is universality and the importance of building the, the community of the church. After her pilgrimage to uh, Mugnano and then returning via Rome, she came back home to Lyon. In 1839, a few years after this, the charity had really blossomed. Pauline Géricault not only inspired the creation of the propagation of the faith, but she also influenced the establishment of what would become another pontifical society, the Missionary Childhood Association. Monseigneur Formin Janson, évêque de Nancy. Il revient en 1842 voir Pauline Jaricot, dont il a soutenu l'œuvre dès le début. Et il lui dit, voilà, j'aimerais faire quelque chose pour les enfants dans les pays. Et Pauline Jaricot lui propose eh bien, de demander à tous les enfants de la chrétienté de sacrifier les sous de leur menu plaisir et de le donner pour les enfants, pour les œuvres et le soutien des enfants dans euh, les missions. Charles of Orban Janson had this deep desire to help children in, in mission countries, both to get to know Jesus and to help them in their lives. His idea was children helping children, children bearing witness to the faith, uh, sharing the faith with children in mission lands. And to this day, it's, it's also worldwide and, and it's part of the missionary societies uh, uh, throughout the world. Le 3 décembre 1848, Pauline Jaricot écrit une lettre à son amie Julia Morin où elle lui parle de l'immoralité, de l'exaspération qu'on trouve dans le monde ouvrier, du désespoir qui touche cette euh, catégorie sociale et elle veut véritablement faire quelque chose pour les ouvriers. In the 19th century, uh... It was a terrible uh, situation in southern France with the Industrial Revolution. So she had this idea to uh, build a factory 
uh, with decent wages, uh, decent spare time for the workers, for their families, for church, for prayer, almost like a cooperative. And she invested all of her money in that project. She enlisted the help of several family uh, financial advisors. She located a site and required two individuals to help her develop it. At the suggestion of one of them, they tried to reconvert uh, an old factory into this spiritual center that also respected worker rights. Two financial advisors asked her for 500,000 francs, an enormous sum in those days, uh, for the reconversion of this factory. Pauline ne pouvait pas gérer elle-même au quotidien cette usine et elle en a confié la gestion à deux personnes qui se sont révélées des personnes malhonnêtes. Et Pauline a été profondément blessée, attristée de voir qu'elle qui avait mis toute sa fortune au service des pauvres, tout ceci était gaspillé par des personnes qui n'étaient pas droites dans leur comportement. Pauline was forced into bankruptcy. Uh, this bankruptcy hurt not only um, the Jericho family, uh, it embarrassed the society and its board of directors. How could this young girl, who's now uh, a woman, how could she fall victim to these two scoundrels? La bourgeoisie lyonnaise lui tourne définitivement le dos. Elle n'est plus qu'une pauvresse. Elle n'est plus qu'une indigente. Elle, qui était une fille euh, qui avait euh, l'argent et qui avait euh, aidé les autres, elle devient à son tour une indigente. As she experienced disappointments, as she experienced various um, people who were trying to take advantage of her, trying to take advantage of the society for the propagation of the faith, and in the midst of all of that, she saw her suffering as united to the suffering of Christ. She registered in the poverty uh, rolls of, of Lyon. And yet she never complained and never condemned those who, who defrauded her. I'm told that uh, after her death, they found behind the tabernacle of a chapel where she pray a little notes to God, asking God to give the ones who defrauded her uh, salvation and forgiveness. So she died praying even for those who harmed her. Woman of remarkable caliber, uh, remarkable humility, uh, remarkable zeal, for, uh, for the spread of the gospel, for the, for the proclamation of the gospel throughout the world. Ce qui est étonnant chez Pauline, c'est qu'elle va jusqu'au bout et jusqu'à la fin euh, garder confiance et garder confiance en Dieu. Elle n'est pas morte martyr, mais c'est une forme de martyr aussi qu'elle a subie. While Pauline ended her life in dire poverty and destitution, the work that she began grew and soon spread all around the world. In 1840, Pope Gregory XVI placed the society in the rank of universal Catholic institutions. Numerous provincial and national councils, including the third of the plenary councils of Baltimore in 1884, enacted decrees and published letters in favor of its development. In the 1880s, the office for the society opened here in the United States. 
Initially, it was based at St. Mary's Seminary in Baltimore. That office, uh, based at St. Mary's in Baltimore, was without doubt a kind of nerve center for the society. By 1908, when it was taken off the Vatican's rolls as a, a missionary territory, the society had relied on the United States more and more for its global missionary efforts. In the post-World War II years in the United States, there was a great sense of confidence in the Catholic Church. And out of this comes a desire to give back. Where we were once the mission lands supported by the propagation of the faith, now it's our turn to give back. A generous and confident spirit that was perhaps best exemplified by Bishop Fulton Sheen, who was the national director of the propagation of the faith. One mother told us about her four-year-old son in Philadelphia who dressed up as a bishop. And because he knew that we were engaged in mission work and helping the poor and the lepers, decided to go out in his rather authentic looking Episcopal costume and beg for our missions. And he collected $25 and some cookies. Uncle Fulty, as he became known, um, was not only a, a prominent intellectual, but also a radio personality and eventually a television personality who used this platform, again, to spread the gospel of mission. Fulton Sheen really raised the bar in terms of uh, collecting for foreign missions, so that by the time he retired in the 1960s, um, it's estimated that $200 million was collected uh, for foreign missions. And the mother wrote to us and said that she was enclosing a check for the $25, which he had collected for the missions and for the lepers, but he was keeping the cookies as his commission. I wrote to the mother and told her that we never have any homemade cookies, and I was suggesting that the next time he keep some of the money and send us the cookies. Well, the work of the mission still continues in various ways in which it supports our missionaries, and propagates the faith is still the main support for many of these dioceses. The Society for the Propagation of the Faith today is one of the largest, if not the largest, missionary organization in the world. It's under the auspices of the pontifical mission. We have uh, four societies. The first one uh, was the Society for the Propagation of Faith, founded by Pauline Jaricot. The second is uh, the Society for the Holy Childhood. Then at the end of the 19th century, again in France, was born the Society of St. Peter Apostle. And the last one was at the beginning of, of the 20th century, the Pontifical Missionary Union. Well, to be pontifical means to, first of all, be under the guidance of the Holy Father and uh, to be universal. They were made pontifical in 1922 by Pope Pius XI. He saw in, in these societies uh, a great um, resource for the universal church uh, for the support of the missions. They are four, but actually they are interconnected. All of them at the heart of their, of their contribution to the church is to promote prayer for the mission. But secondly, uh, there is also charity for the mission. Jesus is the first missionary. He came with the good news. Pauline Jaricot was inspired to begin something that has resulted into the Society for the Propagation of the Faith. We are the Pauline Jaricot of our time. What she did, we can also continue to do. We are called to build upon what Pauline has done. 
And this is our missionary vocation to recognize that encounter with Christ is going to call us to be at the service of one another. Soy un presbítero misionero de la diócesis de Manao y estoy participando de una misión muy particular en medio de los indígenas de Nicaragua, de los indígenas misquitos y mayagnas en la zona fronteriza con Honduras. Esta fortaleza y esta fuerza de la evangelización nace en esta reciprocidad de aquel que recibe y aquel que puede dar. Yo creo que la gracia más grande está en dar. Yo le doy gracias a Dios que soy misionero, que estoy en este lugar tan alejado. Yo siento que Dios me ha bendecido con esta gracia, una santificación que viene por la gracia del Espíritu Santo. The Rupert Center was created in the, the year 2000 and is coming from uh, the needs that we had, in this case in Bataman, of many young people and children that they had disabilities. And uh, these disabilities was bringing them to the hospital and the rehabilitation was asking a long time. So we created this home to welcome them. Many people in Cambodia have been deprived or they take away their basic uh, rights, no? And we need to give them the possibility to have them back and for them to have ownership of them, no? And uh, to be able to work with them, no? With the basic rights. And as we cooperate with that, we're uh, giving back dignity to, to these children, no? To, to serve God through this, these disabled people. Charles, uh, he fell from a tree and got his spine injured. Their families are not able to support them and so someone helped him find this place here. When I see these people suffering, it is really saddening and it gives me a great joy when I am there to help them. And at the end of the day, when someone is happy because of a little thing you've done for them, it gives a lot of joy and satisfaction. First of all, we need a prayer. The energy we derive from the food we eat is not enough. We need God's grace. So it is very important for people out there to pray for us that we may give a faithful service to these people. We do what is required of us. I really see God has really been faithful 
God has done so many things to our lives. He has taken good care of us. God bless you. We are all doing the same work, mm -hmm. each one doing and playing their part, mm -hmm. and especially as disciples and followers of Jesus Christ, Jesus needs all of us. Mm -hmm. And by virtue of our baptism, we are commissioned to carry on that same work. We are all working together to make sure that the good news we have received, the gift of faith we have received, also spreads and reaches to all the ends of the earth. The process for uh, Pauline's canonization was introduced in the city of Lyon by the local bishop in 1907. By 1930, the local or informational cause is closed and the Roman cause begins. So this is a very thorough and detailed examination of all of her collected writings. In the 1960s, early 60s, uh, Pope St. John XXIII had her life examined and had her declared uh, the venerable servant of God. Already then, the process for her canonization was opened, and therefore her life story became more and more known. And in 2012, a young girl, three years old, uh, choked on a, on a piece of food, and clinically, basically, she died. Her heart stopped, everything stopped, and they had to revive her many times. And the doctor said she would never recover. 15 jours après ce drame, apprenant cela, des enfants de sa classe et des parents des enfants de sa classe, sachant que la cause de Pauline est en cours, sollicitent explicitement Pauline pour que par son intercession, after about a month, she sat up. And a year later, she went to the, to the doctor, the expert, um, a neuro, neurophysician, and who looked at the original tests and then looked at her and said, this is simply impossible. This could not have happened. And of course, her parents said, well, it's a miracle. It's a miracle through, through the intercession of Paulina. All of this information was sent to the uh, postulator in Lyon. And then uh, in 2020, in May, the Pope affirmed that this was a bona fide miracle uh, through her intercession. I think it's just absolutely marvelous that now the church is recognizing what she has done and has begun to elevate Pauline to her place in church history where she belongs. Because there are so many people throughout the world who were the recipients of donations um, whether in the past or present. Pauline Jaricot is very important for the mission. She devoted herself to prayer and for raising funds for foreign missions, for training of priests and missionaries. So this work that she started as a humble young woman resulted in gathering many people to pray for the mission of the church, to support this mission of the church. She offered everything that she could including calling upon fellow women to have institutions that were going around doing missionary work. 
and the work that she did those days is what we are witnessing today. Elle peut être proposée comme modèle aux femmes et aux hommes, euh, aux laïcs, aux jeunes euh, pour aujourd'hui, parce que elle nous montre quelque part le modèle d'une foi qui est incarnée. Pauline dies penniless and now is raised to the altars. She died in poverty, and yet now she is among those who are called upon for prayer and intercession by the whole church. Pauline started the Society of the Propagation of the Faith as a local participation in the global mission of the church. It was given the blessing of the Pope to become and to become the center of the church's global outreach, but it never lost its local connection. That represents in so many ways the role of the Society of the Propagation of the Faith in touching hearts and lives, one heart, one mind, and one soul at a time. My real hope is that her life story becomes well known in the church and beyond the church because I think it has, uh, her life has so much to say to us in the 21st century, uh, both as Christians, as Catholics, but also as people of goodwill. And my hope would be that her life become really well known and that her inspiration can, can affect others for the better to make our world a better place to live in.